Hello everyone and welcome! Riot just released a new short story featuring Talia, a character that will more than likely become the next champion. And because you can't get hyped even more than you already are, let's get right into it. The story begins during the Noxian invasion of Ionia. That power of yours was meant to destroy. You don't want to use it? Fine. Let it sink you like a stone. These were the last words Talia heard from her Noxian captain before she got thrown overboard. Fortunately for her, the tide brought her back to the shores of Ionia. Four days passed since that day. The same day, the Noxian forces arrived and began the invasion. Talia ran deep into the heart of Ionia until she could no longer hear the breaking bones of Ionian farmers and Noxian soldiers. More days passed as she wandered into the high skirts of the mountains. One morning she passed an empty shrine and a cheerless air began to move through the valley. Then it grew stronger and it broke through the clouds to reveal a sky clear and blue. A color so pure it felt like she was drowning again. But she still knew the sky. As a child, she saw the same sky covering the sands of Shurima. But unlike in her homeland, the wind here was not welcoming. Talia hugged herself, trying to remember the warmth of home. Her cloak protected her from the snow, but not from the cold. Suddenly, a depression started to sink deep into her bones. I'm hungry, that's all it is, Talia said to no one and everyone. A hare, a little bird, great weaver, I would even take a mouse if it showed itself. As if on command, a grey furry animal popped its head from a burrow nearby. Thank you, she whispered through chittering teeth. Thank you, thank you. Talia took one of the smooth stones in her pocket and loaded it into her sling. The little animal continued to watch her as she slowly started spinning it. The cold gave her arm a jerky feel. When she got enough speed, she released the stone. Unfortunately, a harsh sneeze caused her to miss her target. Talia rocked back, her stomach growling heavily through the silence around her. She took a few deep cleansing breaths, the cold burning her throat. Assuming you're anything like sand rabbits, if there's one of you, there are a dozen more close by. She said to the patch where the animal had been, her defiant optimism returning. She went back down the valley, following her tracks in the snow. In the distance, through the pines, she saw a man in the shrine. His wild, dark hair tangled in the wind as he sat down, head bowed to his chest. He was either sleeping or meditating. Talia breathed a sigh of relief. No Noxian she knew would be caught doing either. Suddenly, this peaceful moment was broken by a sharp crack. Then a rumble started to build up. Talia turned to face the mountain and she saw an avalanche coming for her. She scrambled to her feet, but there was no way to go. She looked down and saw a rock peeking from the dirty ice. She desperately focused. She grabbed the rock and started pulling up. A row of thick columns sprang up from the ground, splitting the avalanche in half in front of her. As quick as it had begun, it was over. Even the lonely wind stilled. She turned around with a sickening realization. The man was gone too. She hadn't just brought harm to an unsuspecting innocent, she had buried him alive. Great weaver, Talia said to no one and everyone. What have I done? Talia quickly went down the snow-covered hillside, waist deep in the snow. And knowing my luck he was probably a holy man, she said. She scanned the area looking for any trace of the man. When she had last seen him, he had been under the temple's roof, perhaps it had sheltered him. As she made her way down to the temple, closer to the trees and away from the sweep of the avalanche, 
she saw two fingers that had broken through the surface. She half tracked and half ran to the pale fingertips. Please don't be dead, please don't be dead, please. Talia dropped to her knees and started to scoop away the icy powder. She uncovered fingers as strong as steel. She reached in and gripped the man's wrist, her own clenching hands barely obeying. If you're not dead already, she said to the man beneath the snow, then you've got to help me. She looked around, there was no one else. She was all he had. Talia let go of his fingers and backed away a few paces. She laid her numb palms to the surface of the snow and tried to remember what the floor of the little valley had looked like before the avalanche. Loose stones, gravel, the memory swam, then coalesced in her mind. It was dark, a coarse charcoal, grey with flecks of white, like Uncle Adnan's beard. Talia held tightly to the vision and pulled up from beneath the snow. Towering ribbon of stone erupted upwards, balancing a lone figure. Unsure of any safe landing, Talia pushed them both toward the pines, hoping that they might break his fall. The pillar of stone fell short and collapsed into the snow, but the trees managed to catch the man before casually dropping him to the surface. If you were alive, please don't be dead now, Talia said as she hurried toward him. The sunlight fluttered above her and dark clouds were moving into the valley. She bent close to the man, reaching out to touch his shoulder. He let out a pained grunt. Before Talia could pull back, there was a quick breeze and a metallic flash. A sharp cold edge of the man's blade pressed on her throat. Not yet time to die, he said in broken whisper. He coughed and his eyes rolled back in his head. The sword dipped to the snow, but the man did not release the weapon. From the look of it, you're pretty hard to kill she said, but if we're caught in the storm, we just might find out if that's true. Talia reached under the man's arm and dragged him toward a small cave nearby as the lonely wind returned. Talia wandered back into the cold. She picked up a stone and looked back to see that the man was still propped against the wall, his eyes closed. Then she quickly pushed a bit of dried meat she found in the man's pack in her mouth, hoping he wouldn't mind sharing if he lived. She stepped back into the warm cave. The slabs of rock she had stacked still glue with a wavering heat. She knelt. Talia hadn't been sure her trick of warming the stones in her pocket would work with something larger. The young Shuriman closed her eyes and focused on the stack of rocks. She remembered the blistering sun on the sands, the way the heat sank deep into the earth long into the night. She relaxed and started working on the stone in her hands. She turned it, warping it and pushing it with her thoughts until it hollowed like a bowl. Satisfied, she returned to the cave opening with her newly formed dish. A male voice groaned behind her, like a sparrow gathering crumbs. Even sparrows get thirsty, she replied, scooping up a bowlful of clean water. The cold wind whispered around her. Talia set the round stone onto the stacks of hot rocks in front of her. You gather stones by hand? That seems tedious for someone who can weave rock. You're not angry, are you? I mean about the snow and the… The man laughed and clutched his side with a groan. Your actions tell me all I need to know. His gittered teeth still held the edge of a smile. You could have led me to die. It was my mistake that put you in danger. I wasn't going to leave you buried in the snow. My thanks, although I could have done without the tumble through the trees. Talia opened her mouth. The man held out a hand to stop her. Do not apologize. He straightened himself upright, taking a closer look at Talia and the ornament in her hair. A Shuriman Sparrow.
He closed his eyes and relaxed. You are a long way from home, little bird. What brings you to a remote cave in Ionia? Noxus. The man raised a dark eyebrow, but kept his eyes closed. They said that I would bring people together in Noxus, that my power would strengthen her walls, but they only wanted me to destroy. They told me they would teach me. They have, but only half the lesson, he said without emotion. They wanted me to bury a village, to murder people in their homes, and I escaped only to bring a mountain down on you. Destruction, creation. Neither is wholly good or bad. You cannot have one without the other. What matters is intent, the why of choosing your path. That is the only real choice we have. Talia stood up, irritated at the lecture. My path is away from this place, away from everyone, until I learn to control what's inside of me. I don't trust myself not to hurt my people. A bird's trust is not in the branch beneath her. Talia had stopped listening. She was already at the mouth of the cave, wrapping her coat tightly around her. The wind whistled in her ears. I'm going to try and find us something to eat. Hopefully I won't bring the rest of the mountain down on you. The man saddled against the warm stone at his back, speaking softly to no one and everyone. Are you sure it is the mountain you seek to conquer, little sparrow? A bird pecked at a thin pine nearby. Talia kicked at the snow, accidentally shoving a clump of it into the top of her boot. She was annoyed at the man's words and at the melting ice slipping past her ankle. The why of the path? I left my people, my family, to protect them from me. Her stomps scared most of the animals around. Only the bird didn't sense any danger from the girl. In her anger, Talia wandered further away from the cave than she intended. Eventually, she found herself looking down from a rocky cliff. She didn't think the man would follow her, yet she sensed something watching her. More lectures? she asked. All she heard in response was a heavy breathing. She slipped one hand into her coat and the other one reached for her sling. She had three stones ready in her pocket. Talia turned to face the presence at her back. There, padding carefully around sharp crags, was a great Ionian snow lion. The lion watched the girl. It dropped two freshly slain hairs from its jaw and licked the blood off of its fangs. Talia couldn't run because she would be chased immediately. Trying to push down the panic that was rising in her throat, she fit a stone into her sling and began to spin it. Get out of here, she said. Her words came out with none of the terror she felt inside. The lion took a step closer. The girl released the stone from her sling. It hit the great beast near the mane as it growled in pain. She started to spin the second stone. Go on, she shouted with even more courage. I said get out of here. Talia let the next stone fly. The lion's hungry snarl grew louder. The bird in the thin pine, sensing no good could come out of this encounter, leapt from the branch and took off on a current of air. Alone, Talia reached into her pocket for her last stone. Her hands shook from the cold and the fear coursing through her. The rock slipped from her fingers and hit the ground, rolling away. She looked up and saw the lion getting closer. The stone was just out of her reach. You gather stones by hand? The man's words echoed in her mind. Maybe there was another way. Talia reached out to the stone with her will. The small rock shuddered, but there was also a quiver in the ground beneath her. The pine beside her still trembled from where the bird had taken flight. The bird's trust is not in the branch. The choice was clear. She could either stand frozen in her doubt, letting the beast come for her, or lean into her power and take the leap. 
Talia, a girl born in a desert land, far beyond the shores of snow-capped Ionia, held on an image of the bird and the empty branch that bounced. In that moment, she forgot the imminent death before her. The loneliness that haunted her fell away and was replaced by her last dance on the sands. She felt her mother, her father, Babajan, the whole tribe encircling her, her whispered promise to return to them when she finally gained mastery over her gifts. She met the gaze with the beast. I have given up too much to let you stop me. The stone began to warp beneath her in a graceful crescent. She held onto the warmth of that last embrace and leapt. A rumbling built beneath her, louder than the growl of the beast. The lion tried to back away, but it was already too late. The ground split in half and pulled the predator in. For a brief moment, Talia floated in the air as the stone beneath her splintered into thousands tiny pieces, no longer solid enough to control. She knew she couldn't hold on to the destruction forever. The girl started to fall, but before she could say goodbye to the world fracturing around her, a strong wind lifted up and fingers like steel grabbed the collar of her coat. I didn't realize you were serious about bringing down the entire mountain, little sparrow. With a grunt, the man pulled Talia up onto the newly created ledge. I now understand why much of your desert is flat. Talia laughed. She was actually relieved to hear his patronizing voice. Talia looked over to the side of the cliff and stood up. She dusted herself off, picked up the lion's discarded hairs and walked back towards the little cave with a new skip in her step. The next part of the story takes place in an Ionian inn. Talia bit her bottom lip and looked around, excitingly bouncing in her seat. The evening was late and the wooden tables were mostly populated. It had been long since she had been around people. She looked to her grim companion who had insisted on the dark booth in the corner. The man was now her teacher. For some reason the man had a frown on his face ever since he agreed to a meal at this remote inn, when it was clear that he was as much a stranger here as anyone else, he relaxed a bit and settled into the shadows. You must focus, he said. You cannot hesitate. Talia was watching the leaves swirling at the bottom of her cup. The lesson today had been a difficult one. It had not gone well. In the end, they had both been covered in dust and shattered rock. Danger comes when your attention is divided, he said. I could hurt someone, she said, eyeing the new rip in the mental wound around the man's neck. Her own clothes were heavily damaged, and so the innkeeper's wife offered her a new overcoat and a traveling skirt. But she decided to keep her tunic, determined not to give up the last bit of home she still had left. Nothing was broken that cannot be mended. Control comes through practice. You are capable of much more. Remember, you have improved. But what if I fail? She asked. The man's gaze drifted as he watched the far door to the inn push open. A pair of merchants came in, stamping off the dusty road. The innkeeper motioned to the open tables near Talia and the man. The first moved towards them, while the second waited for his drink. Everyone fails, the man said. A small edge of frustration passed over the man's face. Failure is just a moment in time. You must keep moving and it too will pass. One of the merchants took a seat at a nearby table and watched Talia. He noticed the golden sparrow in her hair. Is that Shuriman girl? The merchant said. Would have been rare once. The girl stared at her hands, ignoring the merchant. It's a bit more common now that your people's lost city has risen. 
Talia looked up. What? Word has it that the rivers flow backwards too. The merchant waved a hand in the air, poking fun at the mysteries of a far off people he considered simple. All because of your bird god has returned from the grave. Whatever he is, don't make any difference. It all threatens trade. The second merchant joined the first. They say he aims to collect his people, misses his slaves and all that. Good thing you're here and not there, girl. The second merchant looked up from his ale, suddenly noticing Talia's companion. You look familiar, he said. I have seen your face before. The door to the inn opened again. A group of guards entered, eyeing the room carefully. The one in the middle, clearly a captain of some sort, noticed the girl and her companion. Talia could feel a quiet panic rise in the room, as the few guests stood up and made their way quickly to the exits. Even the merchants got up and left. The captain pushed the empty stools to the side as he approached the table. He stopped a blade's length from the table where they sat. Murder, he said. So this is where you've been hiding. Savor that drink. It will be your last. Talia was on her feet just as she heard the whisper of steel drawn next to her. She looked over to her teacher, staring down a roomful of guards. This man, Yasuo, is guilty of assassinating a village elder. His crime warrants the punishment of death, to be carried out on sight. One of the guards leveled a loaded crossbow, another one knocked an arrow to a longbow nearly as tall as the girl. Kill me, Yasuo said. <laughs> You can try. Wait! Talia cried out, but the guards already fired. In the heartbeats that followed, a whirling gust picked up inside the inn. It reached the arrows, breaking them mid-flight. More guards swarmed in, their swords already pulled from their sheets. Talia laid down a field of sharp stone pulling up each rock through the floor in a violent explosion to keep the man at bay. Like a metal lightning, Yasuo slipped through the crowd, cutting anything that got close, leaving a trail of red whirlwind behind him. When all those who had come for the man had finally fallen, Yasuo paused, his breathing heavy and fierce. His gaze locked with the girls, and he prepared to speak. Talia held out her hand in warning. There, at his back, rose the captain with crazy eyes and broken smile. Get away from him! Talia pulled at the cobbled floor of the inn, the flat stones erupting, knocking the captain into the air. There, Yasuo finished the job with three clean strikes. More shouting was coming from outside. We must leave. Now, Yasuo said as he looked at the girl. You can do this, do not hesitate. Talia nodded. The girl tried to contain the power she felt growing from beneath the floor in the inn. A vision passed in her mind. Her mother hemming a raw edge of cloth, singing to herself. Her every stitches running away from her hand. Her fingers a blur of motion. The rock beneath the inn burst in great rounded arcs. Stone columns feathered themselves in and out of the ground like a wave. Talia felt the earth rise carrying her out into the dark night. The wild wind that Yasuo was following behind her. Yasuo looked back at the distant inn. The round stitches of stone had sewn the path shut and blocked off any oncoming approach. It had bought them time, but dawn would be coming soon, and with it, more men for them. For him. They knew you, Talia's voice was quiet. Yasuo, we need to keep moving. They wanted you dead. Yasuo let out a breath. There are a lot of people who want me dead, and now they will want you dead as well. 
If it matters, they named a crime I did not commit. I know. This was the first time Talia heard Yasuo's name. She never needed it. All she needed was to be taught. She watched Yasuo now. It seemed her trust was almost painful to him, perhaps more than if she had thought him guilty. He turned and began walking away from her. Where are you going? Shurima is to the west. Yasuo did not turn back to face her. My place is not in Shurima, and neither is yours, not yet. You heard the merchants? The lost city has risen. Tales to scare the tradesmen and drive up the price of Shuriman linen, he said. And if a living god walks the sands? You don't know what that means. He will reclaim what he has lost. The people who once served him, the tribes. He will enslave my family. Her words echoed through the rocks around them. I must protect them. Don't you understand that? The wind started to pick up. Protect he said, his voice barely a whisper. Does your great weaver not watch over them? Your training is unfinished, you risk your life returning to them. She stood her ground and faced him. They are worth my life. The wind swirled around them, but the girl was immovable. Yasuo gave a long sigh and looked back to the east. You could come with me, she offered. <sighs> I heard the desert meat is quite good, he said, but I'm not done in Ionia. Talia studied him carefully and then reached inside her tunic, breaking a long loose thread. She offered the length of handspun wool to him. He looked at it suspiciously. It's a tradition of thanks among my people, Talia explained. To give a piece of yourself is to be remembered. The man took the thread and tied back his wild hair with it. He chose his next words carefully. Hmm. Follow this path to the next river valley and that river to the sea. He said, gesturing toward a nearby deer path. There is a lone fisherwoman. Tell her you wish to see the Freljord. Give her this. The man withdrew a dried maple seed from a leather pouch at his belt and pressed it into her hand. In the frozen north there are people that resist Noxian rule. With them you might find passage back to your sands. What is this, Freljord? she asked. Ice, he said. And stone, he added with a wink. Then she smiled. You will move quickly with mountains beneath you. Use your power. Creation, destruction, embrace it, all of it. Your wings have carried you far, he said. They might even carry you home. I trust that you will weave the right balance. Safe journey, little sparrow. Talia turned to face her companion, but he was already gone. I'm sure the great weaver has a plan for you too, she said. Talia tucked the maple seed carefully into her coat and started down the path into the valley. The stone beneath her boots started rising eagerly to meet her. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the short story called The Bird and the Branch. I already love the story of Yasuo, Riven and pretty much every Ionian champion but this one is pushing it too far for me. I can't even tell you how much I love this champion already, and being bound to Shurima made it even better. I am honestly looking forward to seeing what will happen next. But for today, that's it. If you enjoyed this video, you can always leave a like or comment below, follow me on all the social media, the links are below in the description, and as absolutely always, Thank you, come again. <sighs> what a video this is going to be. I just wrote this script in... 3 hours? 4 hours maybe? And then I started recording this and that was like 5 hours ago. So just, you know, so, just so you know, 30 minutes of, of a lore video takes me almost 5 hours to record. 
and the thought that I am leaving my home in 12 hours and I need to not only sleep but edit this video and put it on YouTube in time that's a very scary one so if you don't mind I will go to bed so see you tomorrow I guess